is an ultra runner and coach and is also a soldier serving in the British Army. He has uh, a lot of experience in the, the ultra running game and has actually also completed a sub three hour marathon, which is quite a fast pace if you work out the maths. So Lee's here today to talk about some running advice. We're going to get into some good topics here, perhaps about uh, running injury prevention, maybe injury management, and maybe some other topics about mental health and the benefits to, to mental health that running can bring. So without further ado, welcome Lee. It's great to have you here, man. Cheers, Chris. Good morning. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to see you, man. Good to uh, good to have you on the on the podcast here. Yeah, yeah, been oh, looking yeah. forward to it. I suppose we could we could start by just um, talking about one of the the biggest subjects that I always hear you talking about. And yeah, I wanted to get this out first because I don't want to I don't want to miss out on this. It's really important. Yeah. I think it's probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the number one mistake that runners make new runners and experienced runners and intermediate as well is they always run too fast when you <laughs> slower so as a sub three hour marathoner that's yeah good. but can you tell the listeners why you think and why i also think running slower will make you run faster in the long-term game right a little bit of a backstory chris i'm probably going to get slayed here <laughs> um so i haven't run for a club long so I started running for a club in 2019. Um, but before then, I've done 15 ultras to this point. But all but one of those ultras have been inexperienced. Um, my training was, if you were to look at my tra- how I trained, it'd be absolutely mental. And I was always, always, always pulling up with injuries, whether that be calf strains, hamstring strains, knee pain. Um, and finally, something had to give. So when I was doing, when I joined a club, the, the standard sessions would be Tuesday, speed training, Thursday, tempo run, Sunday, long run. Now, the Sunday long run was basically a less you can run the fastest for the longest type of business um so i got into this routine of tuesday thursday and then on these speed sessions i would go all out every single time and then for days and days and days i just could not run because of my legs were battered um and it came to a, a, a point where i was like i'm sick of being injured now i need to find a way of of sustaining a good mileage and getting fitter at the same time and I come across this guy, I don't know if you've ever seen him on, on YouTube, Floris Gaiman. Doesn't ring a bell, no. Right, so basically he he introduced the world of math to me and, and running at low heart rate. Now, I come across him two years ago and I started adopting this training whereby I went out for a run at 150 heartbeats. So they, they work out this form as 180 minus your age and then plus or minus five, whether you're ill or whether you're fit. So I was I thought that was relatively fit. So I kept the plus five and I was just walking all the time. Like the slightest incline I was walking, it was so, so frustrating that um, it was just hard to stick to. But what eventually happened was I increased my mileage base so much that I stopped going to club. So Tuesdays and Thursdays were like, I'm not doing any speed anymore. And the target had always been sub three hour marathon since I started taking running a little bit more serious. And you can always get that sense of feeling whereby the club runners are like, oh, you'll never get sub three by going out and doing eight and a half minute, nine minute miles for eight, nine miles a day. and I sort of not, I wasn't isolated, but like I was sort of like left to the side and people were like, oh, this this will never work because um, they'd never really heard of it in club before, this math, this will never work. And then I run um, in June 2019, I run Yeovil Marathon. Um, I went out with for the weekend in Newquay with the lads for the sta- uh, stag do. I don't drink anyway, um, but 
it was long hours on my on my feet. And then in the morning, I ran a 301. I thought I was going to make it, um, but I took a shot block. Have you seen them, Chris? Oh, like the cliff cliff shots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I took a shot block at like 24 miles, and instantly my stomach just crumped straight away. Um, and we come into the sta- stadium in Yeovil, and I was on like 258, and I thought, oh, I've got this. But then they made me loop the track, so I came in the 301. And then instantly you could start seeing on Strava, this is why I always preach about Strava being an absolute nightmare. People were starting to post math runs. And I'm like, you hypocrites. Um, But it was good because people were seeing that heart rate training actually worked. And then I done a 16 week block, no speed training. Um, The only speed training I would do, Chris, was incorporate marathon paced miles into my long run so let's say i'd go on a long run um at 16 16 miles was my longest my longest long run as well and people on the forums were like oh yeah you you would have run two sub 240 if you'd done a 20 mile run i'm like yeah but i was going for sub three the time i had to train for for the week was this amount of time so i knew that i could run sub three or 45 miles a week um I'd done a 16-week block and I'd do the long runs then with marathon pace blocks, maybe like 4K on, easy 4K marathon pace. Um, and then I run a 257 in Gloucester off a 16-week math block. Um, and then, yeah, instantly people are starting to come round to the fact that by running slower, what the way it actually works for, for the viewers that are watching, um, low heart rate training. So when you go out and run, it's built within us to, if we see a runner, to try and overtake them. If we see a hill, to work hard on the hill. What happens there is you, if if you do a bit of research, you'll work out about energy zones and heart rate zones. If you sprint up a hill, when you get to the top of that hill, you're going to be in, let's say, zone four. It's going to take you a long time to drop back down. What that's doing is your body, when you're running, is your body's pumping, uh, your blood's pumping oxygen around the body to feed the feed the muscles and to in, to ensure the lactic acid doesn't build up. And without going too scientific, you you got the ATP build up, ATP build up. Uh, but essentially, running aerobically at your low heart rate allows you uh, to run for longer without the build up of lactic acid. Therefore, you will get fitter at that same heart rate. So to put it into perspective, when I started math training um, for you, Milers, because I work in kilometers, my first math test where I run four, uh, eight kilometers um, at 150 heart rate was 51 minutes. I'd done one yesterday, and I haven't trained consistently because my medical issues. I'd done one yesterday in 36 or 37 minutes, I think it was. So that's a drop of 15 minutes in 18 months. And... In those 18 months, probably the last couple of months, I've been so sporadic because of my medical issues that if I'd been consistent, when I run sub three, I was four, my math was 4.33, uh, four minutes 33 per kilometre for an hour. So it just shows, and I haven't had a running injury since I started math, not one. So It's amazing how um, how powerful that is, man. It's uh, I've been doing it for a while as well, not not necessarily following the math method but but essentially it is the same method where you're just yeah. just training easy miles yeah um so you've probably obviously you've heard of the concept of base training and yeah people have probably heard of that base training what does that mean and, and there's all different plans you can find online and people will see plans where it says uh like you said go you've got your club sessions but the yeah. plan will have like a tempo run yeah. a speed session like maybe a track yeah. session, and then a long run and it's too much that's free and even if you do take it easy in the long run which you won't if it's a club session yeah it's um it's too much intensity especially if you're if you're in a base phase i would say that, that kind of training does have a place if you yeah. have built up the appropriate mileage and the appropriate aerobic base which we're talking yeah. about yeah it's, it's it's such a powerful tool man and it's like you say if people were telling you you could have done a 20 mile long run yeah but then you're risking the risk of injury outweighs yeah benefits of just doing the the easier lower intensity stuff but the hardest thing i, I think people struggle with is they find it boring 
Yeah, it's boring. It is boring. And like the, the reason people quit it is um, because they have to walk. So w- when people start running, Chris, they, they, or runners who, or, or people who look at running and go, oh, I'm not running because that's too hard. No, it's not. Running should not be hard. Running is meant to be enjoyed and it's meant to be fun. And if you run correctly, like a lot of these club runners, so you get the, the, the very, very beginner. And you, you said they're the base. So the analogy I like to use is building a car. So let's say we're building a car. Base building is building the engine first. When you come to making it faster, fine tuning, putting on, on the exhaust, tuning it, the alloy wheels, that, that then is your speed sessions later on after you've built the engine. Like you, you, but what a lot of people do in club or in general is they'll start running and they'll forget about the engine and go, I'm just going to try and get fast. Yeah. And then it's so tricky, isn't it? Because, because those speed sessions and those hard sessions, they do produce an incredibly quick result in fitness in terms of fitness. Your fitness gains over a few weeks of that type of training is amazing. Yeah. If you were to do the base work first, you can then perform those sessions at a higher intensity because you have more fitness. Because you're not you're less fatigued. Exactly, and you've got less chance of injury because you've built up yeah. the endurance in the muscles, ligaments, tendons. And this is where I think people really need to understand the the longer term picture of this. We're, yeah. Human beings, we're notorious for uh, immediate gratification, aren't we? So you straight go- away instant <laughs> gratification, isn't it? So if you've got, as you just said, that it is boring. Have you got any advice for anyone who is wanting to try and adopt this type of training to A, avoid injury, B, improve their performance long-term? And, and how, how would they, how can, is there any way you can make it easier? Yeah, so. Running, the, walking stuff. The, yeah, the way I, I broke it down, Chris, is I knew that it was going to be a long-term thing um, in regards to, seeing progression but with with heart rate training and building that base you will see progression very very quickly if you stick to it now the way i done it i was like i give myself small wins so every monday even though it'd be a recovery run for me i class it as a an ak math test um so on that monday if i could drop two to three seconds per kilometer quicker than what i did the monday before I'd be psychologically, bang, this is working. I'm in a good place. Continue with it. Sometimes you'll plateau. Um, and where it comes to plateauing with math is what you've just said there. You've built the base, so you're going you're gonna to plateau, but then that's a whole new game of starting to introduce speed training. Now, these, this, what I initially was doing, three speed sessions essentially a week, was ridiculous. Like, I'd build up a solid base first and then maybe introduce a hard tempo on a Thursday. Do that for a couple of weeks and then introduce some short speed repeat intervals. Then introduce your Sunday uh, base run. So taking a small win. So if you start in heart rate training, take the small wins um, as, as a good tick and a good goal set. Um, drop your ego. Is, is the biggest point. Like a lot of people will go out there and they'll be too concerned about how fast um, their average pace, because once it's uploaded to Strava, everybody can see and everybody's got their comments. Nobody gives a fuck about what you write on, what, how fast you go. Like it, they don't care that you're walking uphill. Like if you go, if you were to go onto my Strava, I haven't posted for a while, I posted two days ago uh, or yesterday. That's the first time in three months. But if you were to go on to there, You'd see that I was doing like 545, 615 per kilometer because I'm I'm walking hills. If it's if it's gonna take me over, if I've if I've got a plan, that's another one. Set a plan. People go out and they and they run willy-nilly. Um, then just drop your ego. Don't be afraid or ashamed to walk a hill because you know the benefits at the end. So to wrap that up, set many goals. So do tests every every week or every fortnight to make sure you're progressing. Run off a plan and drop your ego. Yeah, great advice, man. And um, I've I've had it before where and we do all have that ego come in. I've had people like elderly people walk past me on hills when I'm trying to I'm trying to because I do a lot of mountain running. 
Yes. My, a lot of my base training, easy running, it is running up the hills. Yeah. I'm running, I'm pretty much jogging on the spot. It's yeah. really small, high cadence steps up the hill. People are walking, like power hiking past me. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I could power hike, but then my heart rate's going to go up. And yeah, so great advice there. Um, with a heart rate as well, something that I, do you ever use nasal breathing or yeah. even just, yeah. just being conscious of how your body, this takes time and experience, of course, but being conscious of how your body feels. Like I, I can tell exactly what zone I'm in or how easy I run is just by feeling, you know? Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of a lot of heart rate monitors watches can be notorious for being um, yeah. accurate, especially if you've got like if they're dirty or if they've got sweat in your hat or it's cold. Yeah. Um, so, so do you use that method at all, or do you, do you usually go for mostly heart rate? No, no, I have. So like like you said there, after you've done it for a while, you you become attuned to how you're feeling, um, and when you go for a run. You, you, your heart rate could be saying something if you're not wearing a strap and you know where you're feeling. You can talk when you're breathing through your nose, you know you control. So, yeah, you can you definitely become accustomed to to running aerobically um, after you've done it for a while. Is that a quote I've heard you say before? There's the, if you can't talk... Stop and walk. Stop and walk, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good, man. So, like, even if you're on your own, you can start... Or I've heard you, I've heard you saying that you sometimes sing. I always yeah. sing. And it sounds it sounds mentalist, but it's actually it's a really good way because if you can't sing, then you're yeah. definitely you're 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 starting to get above that into yeah. that sort of zone three territory. Yeah. And um I was gonna say as well, for, for me I've got a bit of an advantage because because I do hill running. Yeah. It tends to be out in nature more, it tends to be I am walking a lot of the uphills, but yeah. I've got nice views to take in. So I I don't even like a lot of people use podcasts or yeah. like, like headphones and stuff when they're running. And I think that's another good way you can make this easy running a bit more enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, if you're kind of doing something else at the same time. For me, I don't bother. It, I, I just, it does spike you though. It does spike your heart rate. Music. Does it? Yeah. 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 Is that, is that why my heart rate's always so low? <laughs> yeah, so... If, I, don't, if you, I, don't, I don't listen to the music when I'm running, you see, so, I, so my heart rate's always, like, dead low. <laughs> yeah, and, and what tends to happen, there's, there's two reasons. Um, the, the first one is if a good or upbeat 180 beats per minute tune comes on, you're more inclined to increase your cadence and go a little bit faster. And... Um, when you when you're running without music, you'll see you. It's it's quite it's about five five to ten beats difference. Um, so I could go for a run. I run all my runs fasted um, in the mornings when when I train in the mornings. It's all fasted, um, and when I run with music, it's definitely about five beats higher than than what it would be without death. So yeah, music is 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 one. Not so much podcasts, but like if you're listening to Clubland. <laughs> Unless you're listening to this podcast, and then it's uh, that's going to get your heart rate right down and, and really, <laughs> yeah. really improve your training. So there you yeah. go. Get uh, us on, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, Strava as well, being like Strava, whatever people are using the Garmin apps. When you upload that, now I use Strava. Yeah. And when I'm out on a run, sometimes I'm thinking like, oh, that'd be a good, a good bit on Strava. Oh, you get the segments. That'd be a good bit on Strava, but I don't ever think about my pace. I do sometimes use the segments for training and stuff. Uh, yeah. I try to do a hard session, but yeah, but my it's insane because my pace, same as you, is slower than 95% of the people that I follow on Strava. Yeah. And I, without dropping my ego and stuff, I'd like to think that my running experience is a lot more than a lot of them. Uh, yeah. It's just trying to... I think for a lot of people, actually coming off Strava would be a good yeah. idea for a lot of people. Yeah. Is that what you said you've came off Strava for a few months there. Yeah, yeah. And the only reason it uploaded again is because I changed watch and this was so I bought this yes day before yesterday. And because I had one of these before, it was automatically linked to Strava. So it's unlinked now. So that I've done I've done two runs on there. Um and I unlinked it this morning before we come on this chat. So yeah, I I'll be I'll be back off it. Um purely because um, it's, it is a good place for people for community and 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 to to track your 
your progression on on stuff like that. But if you, I'm a bit of a stats nerd, um, and the Coros app was way better than than any other app than Garmin Connect or anything or anything like Strava. Or I'd say I'm using this now. So when I used the Polar before, the Polar Vantage V, the Polar Flow on the on the desktop predicted my 257 marathon within 50 seconds. So, yeah, so, like, when it's got the running index um, to tell you how fit you are and tell you, like, often these Garmin predictions for your race times are so way off, it's unbelievable. But, like, this Polar Flow, it predicted, like, a 256.30 something, and I run a 257.25. So it was, like... It knew exactly where, where my fitness was at, so um, I don't really need Strava to to gratify. And to be fair, I have been going through a a mental change in regards to uh, illness, so I haven't really been accountable to to training. So that's probably been another reason why I haven't been on there because I haven't been so consistent. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I use Strava for mainly for my training log, really. I just find mm. it, it's an easy way to, instead of having, I used to use a spreadsheet, but instead of having to open up a spreadsheet and go onto the computer, I can just, it just automatically syncs to Strava. Yeah. Go on and look whenever. Um, but yeah, the, the predictions on there are, are well off on Strava as well. I don't, even, I don't even look at the Garmin data, really, to be honest. I yeah. want to look at my cadence. I think that's probably the only thing I would look at on there. Yeah. The Garmin comes up with a a performance indicator sometimes when you're running along. And right, it's always like minus four. Yeah, well, I've had it before when it's like plus seven. And I'm like, <laughs> I just I just done like a, a three and a half hour hill run yesterday. And I'm yeah. like, how many run today? So it's like saying, and I'm like, it's just way off. I don't know where, I don't know how that works. Uh, maybe do, you know, just... do, you, do you know what though, Chris? People will, will actually take that to to heart. Like if they're running and they're, they're using their Garmin and let's say, it usually beeps. What is it usually? It's usually like 10 minutes or something, isn't it? That where it beeps up with the indicator. Is it 10 minutes yeah. or two kilometers? Yeah. And like, I've had it before where it's gone like minus seven and I'm, I'm, I'm out for an easy run. I'm like, oh, stupid thing. People will take that to heart. They'll go on minus seven. I'm like, oh, I need to push harder. And then it'll change the course of the run. Yeah, totally. I, I tend to not even look at my watch when I'm running. I, I try. Yeah. Unless I'm like, unless I'm trying to stick to a pace, I'll have yeah. a little glance at it, which is very rare. Very rarely when I run, I even look at it. It's just, it's just recording it. Um, yeah. Unless I want to have a look at the heart rate. But then again, that's another thing. Going back to the, the heart rate check, I've, I've had people before where um, I've put them onto a heart rate training plan and they've, and they've been looking at their, and I've said, like using nasal rate, and they're looking at their watch the whole time. Their heart rate's just saying, like that. <laughs> that's it. And the heart rate says 180. And it's like, the heart that because they can lock into your cadence, can't they? So yeah. If, you, if you're running along and it's and you're not warmed up properly or you've not got the watch sat right, they can they can lock into your cadence. I think this, the heart rate straps are much more accurate, aren't they? If yeah. You, uh, do you use a chest strap or do you use the watch? I do. I do. Yeah. I've done a comparison actually yesterday uh, or day before on the the Coros Apex Pro with the chest strap, and the this off the wrist it was tight. Um, <laughs> And the only really real difference was like when I was running downhill, it took a little bit longer for this to come back down and settle than what it did on the chest strap. But apart from that, like the because I run mainly aerobic, it's it's spot on. It'd only be I'd only see difference, or you would only see difference. Like you, you, you do a lot of hills, so you'd probably see a lot of difference there because the chest strap would probably capture your rise quicker, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And um, the so so you mentioned about keeping the watch tight there. So a couple of things for anybody listening who is wanting to use heart rate monitor on their watch. First of all, take it with a pinch of salt because yeah. it's, it's not always going to be depending on what type of watch you've got. It's not always going to be that accurate. And try not to let it affect your run, like we just said there as well. Yeah. With, with the, any performance indicators, try and tune into your body and feel how how you feel. Make sure the watch is, is tight. Make sure you've you've washed the sensor on it and it's dry. Make sure you've not got sweat trapped under there. So if you have, if it's if it's hot, you can rub yeah. the sweat off underneath. Uh, is there anything anything else that makes sure it's positioned right on your wrist? 
Yeah, if 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 you're gonna be looking at heart rate, yeah, it's it's not gonna get a correct reading if it's if it's loose. Um, so yeah, tight, tighten up as much as you can. But essentially, yeah, like when it comes to running, you know if you're working too hard. That's the bottom line. It's like if, if you can't sing or talk, then you're going too hard. Unless you're on your plan, it's got a 40 minute tempo run then you don't even need to look at your watch you just go out and and work hard yeah. um so yeah i think it's having that that mindset switch to my easy runs actually need to be easy rather than oh there's a segment here or oh, um my performance indicator said minus seven i need to push on or i need to catch that person up and then when you get home that easy run isn't an easy run. So when you come to doing a session, you're more fatigued and you're going to get less out of that session. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so kind of went full circle there. So back to like your your running club um, explanation in the beginning. If, we, if we're training hard that often, if we've got that much intense work, we're not going to be able to recover fast enough and then train properly. So I, I like to use the, the quote, train, don't strain. So yeah. if you're going out and even if you have got a speed session, it's not a race. Yeah. It's a training session. It's a training session. You shouldn't be yeah. going maximum effort. You know, yeah. unless you're unless you're in a race, you shouldn't be ever training at maximum effort because then, if you've got another session a couple of days later, or even if you're trying to go out on a, a longer, easy run, the risk of injury is going to be massive, and yeah. your recovery is not going to be as good. So you're not going to be able to keep on. You want your training to be progressing upwards don't you you don't want yeah. to be doing this all the time yeah okay no. have time for recovery and stuff but yeah. you don't want to be constantly going up and down and having to take rest days because you're smashing it so hard yeah i am um, like even my mindset's changed over the last 18 months so i posted a video and it was a short on on youtube so you you you'd know i've got two channels i got the vet i run um which isn't really seeing any anything so that's why i switched over to lee run ultras even though it's monetized like lee run lee runs ultras gets way more engagement like i don't care about views or anything like that like comments is is where where i'm at i'm like engaging and helping people like vet i run whilst the community is amazing on youtube uh, on facebook it's not so great on on youtube but i posted a video on there and it must have been about probably about 18 months ago. Um, and I said, um, don't judge me by the, pay, uh, by the pace I train at. Judge me by the pace I race at. Now, whilst that may sound good, I don't care about being judged at all. Like back then, I was like, God, oh, this was like more aimed towards a Strava and how other people perceive you again. But now, um, I don't care about being judged. Like that, that mindset's flipped. I'm like, I'm running for me, not for anybody else or gratification on anything else other than my own personal gains so it sounds great saying don't judge me by the pace i train not judge me by the pace i race at the the bottom line is good however don't judge any fucker excuse my language don't judge anybody 100 percent, man um and it's there is that competitive element which is great but that competitive element should be to push yourself it's not like i want to beat that guy you know yeah. i think this is something that i never understood before i started running races is like why would i want to go and go and race somebody you know what i mean why do i want to go and beat somebody in a race and it's like yeah it's not about that it's about how well you can do and those other competitive athletes can hopefully help you push yeah a bit harder you know yeah to, to better yourself exactly yeah man. yeah yeah love it love it so um so on the whole subject of I'm talking about running easier and we've explained that running too hard and not doing all those easy miles is going to potentially lead to injury. So I've heard you talking about injuries and stuff in the past and how to, how to prevent and manage injuries. What, what advice would you give uh, to the listeners out there? Because running injuries are notorious, especially for ultra runners. So any advice I think the listeners would have. Yeah. Heard? Yeah. So this is probably the, the biggest subject that, us ultra runners will or even runners will come across like they'll you you'll say to someone that you're a runner 
uh, you're a coach, you've got a running channel, and the first thing somebody will say, now it used to it used to be like, oh, how fast can run, how far can run. Now it's, oh, I suffer with bad calves or my shins hurt when I run or I get bad knees when I run. Every single question is fired towards some sort of running injury, <laughs> and and it's. I've been quite like like I've just like like we spoke about earlier, and I'm sure you've been through it yourself, especially with with all the mountain climbing you do. Um, we've experienced some clear injuries and and some pain before that we thought right. The key point to when you get injured is you need to sit down and assess how that's happened. So, my last running injury was. Um, a, I had a, a tight it, it, it turned out not to be a running injury it, it's um, the high piriformis so when you sit down and drive it's getting like a tight um, glute high piriformis syndrome so I thought it was a running injury so when I was running it was causing me pain but it was nothing to do with that in fact it was, it was the sciatic nerve basically getting compressed um but the, the key thing to do when you get injured or when you feel any pain is to identify where it's come from and this is why we get so many questions because people just don't have a, an understanding of of biomechanics and, and the kinetic chain and how the body works effectively um so if if you were to start running i'd say to start researching the anatomy and physiology of the body and how it works. So quite lucky I've been a PTI for 13 years and I've taken a keen interest in, in how we, um, how we move basically. Um, I, <laughs> I was lucky enough to get a ACL injury playing dodgeball, believe it or not. So I was deployed in Estonia and we were having a dodgeball competition. I jumped for the ball and as I landed on my left leg, it popped. Um, therefore, it ruptured my ACL and my lateral meniscus. There was a time where I thought, yeah, it's just a, a dodgeball injury, but it's not. That wouldn't have happened if I had strong kinetic chain, if I'd been focusing on strength and conditioning of the glutes, the hips, the legs, if I had done those and not neglected them, because we can all sit here and say that, yeah, strength and conditioning is, is an essential part. And it'll be people that, that will run and not get injured um, by, by chance and not do any strength and conditioning. But if you don't, you put yourself a higher risk of injury. So the way I found about getting or staying injury free besides the aerobic training, is identifying what parts of the body are used when running. So your kinetic chain, so essentially from your, your hips down. Um, now, a lot, of people, a lot of people will look at me stupid when I say, if you're getting knee pain, chances are you've got tight, uh, weak glutes or tight hips. And they'd be like, but my knee's hurting. I'm like, yeah, but it's because of something else. It's because of the kinetic chain. So if you've got weak glutes then the glutes aren't going to be activated when you're running there's a there's a there's a muscle called the tilbur band syndrome that runs from your hip to your knee if you're weak it's going to tighten therefore your knee's going to hurt so it's having an understanding really doing some research on injuries calf calf is the biggest one on oh, my calves hurt when i'm running nine times out of ten it's cadence like a lot of runners will run and they'll start running and the cadence, and you, you mentioned cadence earlier, Chris, cadence, cadence essentially means ground contact. The longer, on you, you, the longer your foot is on the ground, the more shock is going to be sent up through your knees, through your legs. And that, that therefore is going to cause more pain. So yes, yeah, it's, it's doing a deep dive into research and, and seeing what works for you and how to come up with a strength routine really. Um, but yeah, we could sit and talk about strength training. What do you do for, for strength training, Chris? Do you do any or do you just? Yeah, I do. I do strength training. To be honest, I do it pretty much every day in some way mm. or another. But I do, I try and do, 
a lot of it's kind of just ad hoc. So yeah. let's do like I'll do some work on my glutes before I, I go out for a run or something, and that works as a preactivation as well. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I'll I'll do I do have a structure where because obviously not every week you don't always get the chance to. to yeah. Do life gets in the way so i have three sessions that i make sure i do every week one's a prehab focus so that is mainly focused on any areas that i'm having problem areas that i think are weak or could potentially get injured and that always includes the, the key areas such as the, the calves and achilles yeah. so calf raises i'm doing yeah. calf raises pretty much three four times a week at least yeah um, boring exercise but really prevents that just prevents that Achilles tendinopathy. Yeah. I've had that before. You don't want that. That can take out for a long time. Uh, single legs for runners. I th- I think single leg exercises are great for runners. Single the biggest, leg, yeah. Single leg squats, single leg Romanian deadlifts. Again, glutes. The glutes are notoriously weak. Um, as a culture, we've just we've just became. We used to have to go out and graft all the time and work hard. You know. Now we tend to have more sedentary lifestyles. The glutes become inactive. You know, uh, all the driving we're doing, all the setting yeah. desks we're doing, the glutes become inactive, the core becomes inactive, uh, the posture becomes poor. So for somebody to try and go out from not running at all to then trying to run with poor posture, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's not going to work well for them. And that's the that's where the strength and conditioning is key. Uh, a lot of things I think, a couple of things runners I think miss out on though, is uh, you mentioned the lower body, really important to prevent injury and stuff but i think the upper body is really important posture so working on working on rows and stuff yeah i do a lot of rows uh, even pull-ups things like that working when you talk about core not just the the six pack and the abs the back as well everything yeah lower back the lower traps the rhomboids all these things are, are key so yeah so go back to what you said what do i do i do the, the prehab routine uh, which involves a lot of boring exercises with like with silly little tools and stuff yeah i love the resistance bands yeah i use them as well yeah they're great oh, they're, they're amazing yeah and then i try and do two other sessions where i do a, a kind of heavy one which will be like sometimes i will throw in some like heavy deadlifts heavy yeah. squats and stuff and then i'll do one which is really uh, a muscular endurance type but also is so it's aimed at specific mountain running yeah and also again it's, a, it's another injury prevention and that's like a lot of, that's more high rep um high rep work. like a hit yeah k- kind of it's just like step ups and stuff stuff, yeah. stuff stuff that's simulating the motion of running up hills yeah Lung- lunges as well are great um yeah so i'll fire the question back at you man what's what's your kind of strength routine then what's yeah so it's, it's been difficult with with regards to getting the, the heavy stuff because um, if I was to show you, I am building a, a gym of the back, um, but it's it's in the early stages. So at the moment, I've got n- and I have had no opportunity to lift heavy. Um, so every single day is I'll do band work um, now, and that that consists of when I get into bed, I'll do lateral lateral raises, clams. Um, Bridge, glute bridge, single leg. I didn't come across single leg until I'd done my ACL injury. And then I realized how important balance and proprioception was. Um, And just how crap I was in it. Like, literally, I could not stand on one leg and brush my teeth before before this injury. But now I make a a conscious effort to to ensure that I can single leg pistol squat, I can single leg Romanian deadlift. Um, and like, like you, it's, it's sporadic. So I could be washing the dishes and I'll stand there on one leg and do some lateral raises with a band or... So for me, I've got no specific strength session whilst, whilst I'm at home because I haven't got the physical ability to lift heavy, but every single day has... Um, a some sort of band work and balance pro perception and like you said posture is massive i i was bad for this in the past but the, the further you run in it in an ultra marathon the more you slouch the more you slouch the heavier your head the tighter your hips are going to get so yeah your hit sessions will, will sort that out your, your press-ups um your spider-mans your mountain climbers 
Um, so I, I try to do, I, I, I don't know if you've heard of the app Freeletics. Yeah, I have, yeah. I, I love that app. I, I try to do at least one Freeletic session, maybe two a week. Um, it's hard graft, but um, you've, you've obviously got your fitness test coming up. You know that you have to keep, you have to maintain that upper body posture and strength at, at all times. Um, and it goes, it goes without saying that you need to master it all. You can't just work uh, lower, lower limbs. So yeah, at the moment, once I'm over, you know, once we're in camp, we've got like the, the facilities to lift heavy, but at the moment I just haven't. So it's, it's sporadic as and when, but some, at some stage of the day or every day is there, there is some sort of strength and conditioning. In. And obviously I couldn't live without my foam roller and tennis ball. Um, okay. I foam roll and tennis ball every single day. And I have done for the last two years. Yeah, mobility is key as well, isn't it? And uh, now for, for lifting heavy, I don't personally think lifting heavy is, is really that necessary for, for injury prevention um, or, or even for, no, for, runners, str- for runners in general, but it can yeah. be a powerful tool to really, um, well, it's good for you anyway. It's, yeah. good your, it's good for your joints and muscles. And I think a lot of runners get confused. They think they're going to start putting on loads of muscle. Obviously, yeah. too much muscle and too much weight is not ideal for, uh, for agility. And, and sports like running, you want to be fairly fairly light, not too light, but you want to be yeah. quite nimble. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely a place for, for heavy strength work as well. You mentioned balance and proprioception as well, which is, which again is key. I think, I personally think that if you cannot stand on one foot and close your eyes for 30 seconds, right? It might take a couple of tries. Yeah. If you can do that after a couple of tries, I don't think you should even be going out running. Yeah, I couldn't. Like two years ago, what when I discovered it, I could not stand on one leg and brush my teeth. Yeah. Like it'd be all over the shop. Yeah. And what what you gotta realize then is if you do a deep dive, is like your um your activation muscles in your ankles, if they're so weak that they can't hold you. If you're going on a trail and you're placing your your foot placement on something that's uneven you're gone. You're going to have a, an ankle pop straight away. Yeah. Um, so I didn't realize the importance of, of balance and proprioception until I, until I done prehab. Um, so that's, this is why I shout so much about strength and conditioning and, and balance and proprioception. I think there's a video on my, on my channel of, um, of me doing some balance and proprioception work with uh, some speed cones, some boxes, a football, um, just with, with a mate walking back and forth, um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a big part of, of injury prevention. Um, and you, you'd be surprised how many people won't, won't be able to stand on one leg and brush your teeth. Like yeah. try If you're watching this now, try when you brush your teeth tonight, stand on one leg. And if you can do it, close your eyes. <laughs> and then I bet you, you won't be able to do it. It's uh, it's very hard at first, but you very quickly, you regain that proprioception. Um, I mean, Again, this can get quite quite complex, but if you if you spend a lot of time wearing shoes, now we're not going to get into the subject of barefoot running and that just now, but yeah. if, if there's a whole other topic that we could probably talk about for for a long time as well. But yeah, if you if you go around the house barefoot and stuff a bit more, your proper section is actually going to be increased because your the muscles and the, the nerves in the bottom of your feet are going to be uh, more responsive and it's going to become easier over time. Now. The the whole thing about proprioception that like you said there, if you if you go out on a trail and you can't if you can't do this standing on one leg with your eyes closed, right? It sounds like this that sounds daft because yeah, you know, it sounds silly, eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. You're not going to be running with your eyes closed, are you? But that it's it's really key to have that mind body connection and be able to activate. You're not only just learning how to balance on one leg, you're learning how to no. activate the right muscles. If you try and yeah. do that, raise your opposite leg. So everybody, like like Lee said, tonight when you're brushing your teeth, if, if you want to challenge yourself even more, raise your other leg. Yeah. Squeeze squeeze that opposite hip. So squeeze the glute and you'll feel that glute firing. So a great way you can... I personally think a lot of runners understand that they should be doing this stuff, but yeah. they just don't have the time, or yeah. which is an excuse at the end of the day. Yeah. But personally, I try and mash it up into my, into my routine. So I get... I get um, 
I'm going to run, I'll make sure I do some balance, proprioception, a little bit of activation first, single leg squats, things like that. And that does two things. It's a little bit of strength and conditioning work that you've just done because it's in your yeah. And secondly, it's prepare you for the run. So you've already kind of activated those those muscles. Do you do much activation before you, you run? Oh, yeah. Running drills, things yeah. like that? I never used to. I never used to. Like when, when I first started math, I'd just go out and and run um, straight straight off because I was like, oh, I'm running easy. There's no point. But then what I found was it took me about 10 or 15 minutes to actually feel like relaxed. Um, but then when I started, I was like, 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 like you said, I need to, I need to change. Um, when I started and only simple things, I, I like, I'll do some lunges. I'll do some crab walks. Um, I'll do some leg swings um single leg so like you said they're working on that that balance um so i'll spend about three or four minutes before i start running um i'll do some squats as well also um but then when when you're running you you automatically feel better um you feel looser if that if it sounds weird it does sound weird saying it but spending that three or four minutes before you go for a run will prevent so much happening during the run yeah no you're spot on it's um it's just you're getting that posture set because like you said the whole kinetic chain is all involved so when your glutes are on your posture is going to be better your your knees are going to be more stable everything's going to be working correctly you know and you touched upon mobility as well there now so for anybody watching on youtube they, they maybe haven't realized yet but all my podcasts that i've been recording i actually sat on the floor so i'm actually sat on the floor doing mobility work pretty much most of the day I, I try and avoid sitting in chairs too much and stuff just because mainly because I have a tendency to have rounded shoulders and a kythotic posture so I do a lot of stuff like rows to try and reverse that but mobility like right now I'm on the floor and I can actually just sit in a kneeling position I'm actually mobilizing the calves the Achilles and the ankle a little bit you know um foam rolling and stuff is great as well so did you have like a a mobility routine or do you just do it in the evenings before you go to bed or what's your kind of what's your take yeah so yoga <laughs> yoga um yeah yeah I, I i do yoga every day um so that's besides the phone rolling um so like 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 you are there when i come in from a run i'll spend um the the time on the floor so I'll sit on the floor, I won't sit on the settee, my legs out straight, make sure I'm, I'm um, flushing all the lactic acid out. And I don't know where I got it from, and I don't know really if it works, but I understand the science behind it. You might be able to tell me different, but I've got it from cycling. So when I come in, I, <laughs> I'll sit on the floor and raise my legs against the wall. In, in my head, what that's doing is the, fl the lactic acid lactic acid is flushing out and we we know we've got valves in our hips that drain and then obviously you pee it out um so when i raise my legs up for a couple of minutes in theory and i don't know if it's, you guys will be able to tell me in theory my lactic acid because the blood flow is flowing to my hips is is flushing the lactic acid out and i've seen hundreds of cyclists do it so i just do that for a couple of minutes when i come back from a run then i work on a static stretching um, and I'd like to hold my stretches for um, about a minute. Um, and yeah, I'll spend about 20, 25 minutes after after every run whilst drinking a, a blue pint of milk. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that sounds quite similar to what I do as well, actually. The elevation, there's definitely... Um... Now, with these things, there's a lot of science and stuff behind them. But I personally believe a lot of these things that you do, right, these little things take a little bit of time. A lot of them are placebo, I think. Yeah. Right? And if you, and more and more science is coming out about this as well, actually. It's yeah. The more you believe something works, yeah. the more you believe something is going to help you recover faster, you will recover faster. Your yeah. body will feel better, you know. So I do very similar to you. I come in after uh, after a run, I'll do a bit of foam rolling, I'll, I'll do a bit of stretching, um, like more specific stretching than what I'm doing right now on the floor this is just like you know there's not really anything any yeah but i'll do some like specific areas where i feel like are, are tight so 
for me, the TFL, which can be a common culprit for IT band syndrome. Um, calves, runners always get tend to get yeah. tighter calves. Um, not so much if you look after that cadence, like you mentioned before, in the form. And then I'll elevate my legs up. Another thing I do as well, actually, and I've been doing more recently, is compression. Do you ever use compression? Yeah, so I've got um, skins. Now, I, I don't use them all the time, and I'll only use them if I've done a long day or a specifically hilly day. Um, so for my normal runs, my normal day-to-day runs, I won't, I won't use it. Uh, but if I've gone out and done a, a big trail run with some serious elevation, then, yeah, once I've had a bath... Um, and uh, stretched off. I, I'll put my. Uh, I don't know if you know the brand. Two times you. I'll oh, yeah. put them on it. Yeah, I'll put them on then. Yeah, because there's a. I was reading a study actually earlier in the week about this, and something like after a, after a session, if you put the compression garments on, yeah, and leave them on for 24 hours afterwards, uh, it can have really good effects on on recovery. Um, yeah, essentially increases the blood flow, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. You want. You want blood flow to the area. And this is where there's a there's a lot of stuff. You mentioned the bath there. Now yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on about ice baths at the minute and and ice. Now a lot of people think ice great for recovery, but a lot of people are coming out now and saying actually you've got to be very careful with this because what you're doing there is potentially actually inhibiting your recovery. So yeah. it's a it's a bit of a controversial subject at the minute because there's a lot of people out there who love ice baths and I I love an ice bath as well. Um, for more for the mental aspect, but yeah, do you use, do you use ice baths, warm baths, Epsom salts, what, what? Both, both. So, yeah. uh, you would probably would have seen a vlog a couple of weeks ago where I done the after a long trail run, I jumped in the river. Um, and I, I seen so the, where I get it from and um, why I think it would work is we know the the acronym RICE, Rest, Ice, Compression, Elevation. So when when you do ice, if you do it for too long, then it can be bad in my eyes because it stops the... Basically, when you when you get injured or you've injured an area, you apply ice, so if, if you've run, you apply ice, basically then that stops the blood flow because what happens is the body sends blood to that area or red blood cells to try and fix it but it, it overloads and that's where swelling happens. Um, so when you put ice, it slows down. But if you hold it ice for too long, it stops. So without getting too scientific. So that's why I think icing works. Um, I don't do it all the time. Um, I do like a hot bath. Um, purely because when I have a hot bath, so I come in, I'll nine times out of 10 have a pint of milk. I stopped having protein shakes. I, I, I find I get the same benefit from um, drinking a blue pint of milk. And I watched a podcast actually. It was with Jonathan Walter and his next ex squad. He done that he done a podcast with um, that uh, Floris and he's 49 and he's just run a two twenty nine marathon and he trains at math and when he comes in, he has a blue pint of milk. I was like, ah, I'm not the only one. Um, and then once I've had a hot bath, I, in my head, I'm more malleable to jump on the foam roller and work the tight spots if I have any. Uh, but then I will have the occasional ice bath if I've had a long day and I think that my muscles need it. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in, in one camp. Like, I'm not, oh, yeah, it works or it doesn't. I'm like... I do do the cold water therapy and, and the Wim Hof. I have tried it. I am a fan of it, but I do also like a hot bath. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm in, I'm in both camps and I, I probably stay that, stay that way to be fair. Yeah. I, I'm the same, man. I do. I tend to, to go for the hot bath uh, in the evening. If, if I've got tightness in the muscles, or whatever, Epsom, get, get the Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate in there and it relaxes the muscles. And then I can go and do some, some extra foam rolling and stretching. The ice baths, so so from what I gather, without going too much into the, the science behind it all, is if you go out and exercise, you cause inflammation in your body, you cause it, there's an yeah. inflammatory response, and the body shuttles stuff to that area, and it causes, yeah. you actually want that response to take place, because that's yeah. the body's natural mechanism to then recover and 
build back stronger. If you yeah. just jump straight in the ice bath afterwards, it could potentially blunt that response. So it's like, yeah. and then, so so what I've been doing lately, instead of just jumping straight in the ice bath, is what I was doing for a while, especially in the summer. It's quite nice, isn't it, after a, a long yeah. haul, jumping the river or, or the ice yeah. bath. Is, uh, is I'll, I'll wait till, I'll come in, I'll do my foam roll and stretch and elevation, whatever, have some lunch, and then later in the day, I'll maybe go in the ice bath if I feel like I need to, yeah that that benefit from it or first thing in the morning just jump in the cold shower you know again i think a lot of these things they're not as important as having a correct training plan such as using the base training yeah and um just a structured plan where you're taking your time building up your mileage properly and just resting you know getting good sleep and yeah. all that stuff i think all these other little hacks yeah. the niceties isn't it yeah, they're going to make that big a difference in the grand scheme of things. I, I don't know, you know. No, nah, yeah. Um, some of the some of the best athletes in the world, um, they don't they don't tend to do that much. They just like you mentioned earlier, you touched on earlier, you could have some great runners who don't do any uh, strength and conditioning. Yeah. And uh, there's a good example. Um, what's her name? Is it Courtney? Courtney De Walter. De Walter. Yeah. She, and again, she, she she was on a, a podcast. I think it was a Joe Rogan podcast. And she was like, he was asking her, oh, so what do you do to recover from these? Like, she does like run, train run. She's like, I oh, just just uh, just eat nachos and drink beer. And yeah. Like, she doesn't yeah. do any stretching or foam rolls. Uh, a little bit, you know. And it's like, but you, yeah. can't look, you can't look at that and think, oh well, if she does that, then I'll do that because yes, yeah, one person in it. Yeah, everybody's different. You know, there is there is a genetic factor involved, and again. It, You've got to look at different individual lifestyle factors as well, haven't you? So massively, yeah. Yeah, yeah, interesting, man. Although I, I, I blue paint the milk, um, I don't, I don't do any dairy myself, like so. so no, maybe, I know, yeah. Maybe, maybe I could do some almond milk or something, you know. Just <laughs> <laughs> what well, after? Yeah, I, I tend, yeah, yeah. I don't really tend to to do protein shakes or anything either. I just, you know, just eat normal food. It's like yeah, I don't think there's really that much. Um, I'm not saying protein shakes are are bad and they don't work, whatever. I just I guess, yeah, you know, it's, I think a lot of it's in your mind, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I I just do it for ease, like yeah, yeah. because not that I don't think it. I don't know if it probably the placebo factor makes me feel better, but like we always get drummed into us that when you train, um, you've got that golden forty-five minutes to replenish your muscles, otherwise you you're gonna die. So I think it's just a case of, right, when I get back, I need to get something, the quickest way to get nutrients to my muscles. Um, and yeah, I just, I just get get a pint of milk. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because I had a guy on the podcast a couple of weeks back, Juju J. Yeah, I watched it, yeah. I watched it, yeah. And he and He's interesting, man. He, he goes out and does, he'll go out and do like a, a 30 mile run. Yeah, no food. No food. And he'll come back and go for a nap, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and then he's recovering, and then he's going out again later on and leading people out in trails. It's like, so, so it really is, and that, we've got to be very careful here because that that's the way he's trained himself. Yeah, it's, it's like, amazing how, in, how individuals like operate. Like, it's once it, he's found that's worked for him. Do you know what I mean? Like, but if if the average person off the street was to go and try what Juju J does, they'd crumble. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's very individual, and and a lot of people. Um, as much as people hate on sugar all the time, like a lot of the best athletes will just absolutely smash sugar. So yeah. just do, obviously you've got gels, you mentioned cliff blocks earlier on, and, and sports drinks. Essentially, the, the, they're just sugar drinks. Yeah. It's just sugar water. So you could literally come home and just down sugar water. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's, that's the worst thing in the world. It's like, well, if you're active and you're, if you're, you know, if you're depleting your glycogen stores. Yeah. Sugar's going to go straight back into the muscles. You're not going to, you know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah. So nutrition is really interesting, especially once you you've got the standard nutrition, right? Which is so complicated. But then when you look at the sports nutrition, um, it's just it's so. What works for one person might not work for another, but also at the same time, I think there's a lot of that the whole forty-five minute window thing. There's a lot of science behind that as well. So I'm not going to I'm not going to sit and slate that, yeah. that off at all. You know, there's a lot of good science behind that, um, but is it really 
you know what I mean? Is that as powerful as the as the mindset? And the yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm 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 not going to sit here and preach nutrition because I <laughs> my diet is terrible. Um, it's not it's not the best. Although I try to eat clean at least once a day. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not the best uh, nutritionist about because I do love a snack. Yeah, I mean, I do personally, I personally think if you're a runner, an ultra runner or an ultra endurance athlete, you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of what you can get away with eating. Yeah. Else, you know, um, if somebody was a sedentary person who's working a, in an office, I would give them a completely different diet plan to somebody who was like, who's running 100 mile weeks and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, it's totally different. Um, the body will use those resources in different ways whether they're yeah. storing it or, or burning it off but anyway man um let's talk about let's talk about mental health i think because we i think you touched on it at one point earlier on running is really powerful isn't it for for mental health and there's a lot of stuff out there about mental health just now with with everything that's been going on in the world people are really struggling and a lot of people are turning to running i think for yeah. uh, for that it's, it's it, for me personally First of all, it's so accessible, you know. Technically, you don't even need trainers, but most people yeah. like trainers. So you've, you, yeah. you're trainers, you know, you don't really need any special clothes. A short T-shirt maybe is ideal or something, and you can just head at your door, and you don't need any fancy garments. You don't need all this. You don't need all this equipment. You can just go out and run, you know. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think that's that's why it's so powerful as a tool for for getting out, getting away from these screens all the time. Yeah, really getting out of nature a little bit and taking your mind away from it. What? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you think? In terms yeah. Of- so, I running for mental health for me. Um, so I I set up Vet I Run. Now I thought of this whilst I was running. Um, that there was a point where I felt lost in in life. Good career, nice house family, kids, nice car, all this that you'd look at a typical 30-year-old and think, oh, he's doing well for himself. But I just felt lost, Chris. Like like I was heading in a direction that I didn't want to be going and I didn't know what I could do about it. Like I, I just felt like nothing I did was what I should be doing. And it's a horrible feeling being lost. And I started running when I say running, I've been running a long time, but like running for me was always a, a getaway. Um, and I started thinking if if I'm feeling this good after a run, surely there should be other people in my same situation um, that could get the benefits from not just running, but exercise in general, like going out for a walk. Um, so when I, whilst I was running, like a lot of people, I hear a lot of people say, oh yeah, I use it to to go away and, and not think and, and just get away from everything. I'm the complete opposite. Like when I go for a run, I'll fix everything. Like if I've got problems going on or I'm doing something, when I go for a run, by the time I come back, I've got that problem solved. Like, so when I went for a run at this particular time, I was like, if, I, if I'm feeling like this and runs are helping me, surely other people can benefit. So what I've done and you, you yourself as well we've lost like we would have lost so many mates to suicide since coming back from afghan and iraq um that i just wanted a platform that would support so i set up a, a vet i run play on words for veteran um and it's a, it's a group on on facebook we're nearly three thousand strong and essentially the, the bare bones of it is that i encourage people to if they're struggling with mental health and well-being and and depression and anxiety to and i know it's easier said than done but to put your trainers on go for a walk or go for a run because chances are if you're in a low spot by the time you come back from that run we all know but running and exercise in general releases endorphins and that feel good factor you're going to be in a better place than where you were when you woke up in the morning um so the whole premises of the group was to encourage a better well-being through general exercise and to incorporate that community feel. Um, so 
running for me and exercise in general should be, in my in my opinion, uh, should be. And I know not every individual can do it because of um, disabilities. I'm, I'm speaking for physically able, um, mentally able people should be prescribed. Like if they're feeling low, they're feeling depressed, the doctor should say to them, you should try and get at least 30 minutes active. Um, and yeah, I think the community aspect of it as well, also they encourage people um, to get out there. And if, if they're having a bad day, they'll reach out and, and, and tell them, and then they'll, they'll have that support network for, for them to say, look, everybody, everybody's been in your boat. You're going to feel better and all this kind of stuff without going too deep. But yeah, for me, mental health and running come, come hand in hand. If you want to feel better, then you've got to exercise. 100%. And um, what, what all that would be if we prescribed exercise instead of medication all the time, you know? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd probably get shot down for saying that by some people, but it's it's what I think. No, I, I agree. And, um, yeah. and yeah, some people maybe can't run, but they could, hopefully, I know not everybody can, but hopefully they not, have some yeah. form of exercise, you know? Yeah. Um, cycling walking yeah i mean whatever whatever you can do just to get out and i think about a major part of it as well is to get away from uh just to get away from stuff like you could have work issues you could have stuff on your mind if we've, if we've constantly got these devices around us all the time yeah i'm notorious for taking my phone out on, on runs and stuff but a lot of yeah. the time it's on airplane mode you know yeah pretty much unless i'm posting a story on instagram or something it's yeah. on airplane mode. i'm not I don't start scrolling stuff on my yeah. run, but yeah. at home it's much more it's much more accessible to do that. And then, in my eyes, you're not you're not looking after your own mind because you're always focused on the external stuff. Yeah. You go out and run, you know, you're you're fo- you're going inward, aren't you? Um, so that's great that you've set that group up. And I mean, we, we need more stuff. We need more people to to talk about mental health. And, but not just talk about mental health. You know, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of, let's speak up about it, which is great. But it's yeah. like, what can we actually, what are the actionable steps we can take yeah. you know, to deal with it? And one of them is exercise, without, yeah. without a doubt. You know, it's uh, massive, massive. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think so anyway. Yeah. And so... I think I think even just starting with somebody, see somebody's listening to this right now, and they can't, and they're like, oh, they're talking about running. I'd love to be able to go and run. Going back to what you said earlier on, and if you're if you're physically able and you're not disabled, you can you can run. You may have to start yeah. walking first. So, yeah. personally, if, I, if I've got somebody who comes to me and says I want to learn, I want to learn to run, um, not learn to run, well, not to run, but I want to be able to run, yeah, whatever a marathon or something. It's like, right, well, let's just start by walking. Yeah, manage and expectations, then, yeah. And then we can walk, run. You know, there's yeah. a 5K program, which is kind of going viral, whatever. That's that's great as well. Um, and then you can just build up real slow and and even just getting out for a walk, man. It's Yeah. Somebody that's unhealthy and unfit, that is going to be the same as going for a run to somebody yeah. that's, that's fit, you know. Well, of course it is, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, man. So uh, everybody check out his uh, Vet I Run. And is it, so is that, that cl- is that like an online club that you can just join? or? Yeah, so it's a face- Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to request to join, but yeah. yeah. It's, it's, open, it's open to everyone. It's not just um, veterans, which which people think, but it's open to everyone that, that is into exercise and, and looking to be in a community that encourages positivity. Yeah. I think I'll have to go on Facebook and remember to, to join. Yeah. With, you know, just get in there as well. And I think so. You you mentioned that you you felt like you were in a place where you just didn't you had no kind of direction. You know, it was like you were a bit lost. Is that, that's what you yeah. said. You yeah. Do you think something as simple as having running goals, like yeah. whether it's a sub three hour marathon, whether it's a just to run a continuous five k you know just having that goal there something that's outside of kind of normal life you know yeah. is 
it gives you a bit of purpose. It gives you a bit. Of, it gives you something to get up for, something to get out and, and go after. You know. Yeah. What do you? Do you have any advice for anybody who is feeling lost and and wants to? Obviously, apart from joining your your group that I run, um, what advice you would have for them? Like maybe setting goals, maybe yeah. maybe just getting after it and and, and getting yeah. started. Yeah. Um. It's it's a very very difficult area in regards to um having having been through that that patch and doing some some intense research there's hundreds of thousands of people that felt the way that I did in regards to being lost and, and no sense of direction and for me I'm an I'm an analyst I like to analyze why I've got to that stage and and where I can go from that stage um, and I think the reason I got there and the reason I was there is in in life we all we all set goals and we all um, work towards something. Once we've got there, you, you you've done it. It's like, what what do I do now? Like I've I got to a point in my career where I'd done all my promotion courses. I'd been a sergeant a long time, and I was like, what, what do I do now? Um, and it was just finding that the ultimate thing you need to do is find your why. It sounds cliche and cheesy, but like find what you enjoy. Um, and for me, it was fitness and helping others and, and seeing others progress. Um, so that that will always be my purpose now to pursue your purpose, really. It will always be my purpose to, to try and help other people um and fitness is is my why so find your why if it's something you enjoy whether that's fixing cars or or um skateboarding or whatever find something you enjoy if you feel lost focus on that thing and then you can set like you said there setting goals setting mini goals because often I felt I, I believe I felt lost because I didn't have any direction. I didn't have any goals. I didn't have any purpose. I was just coasting. Um, and it's a it's a crap place to be when you when you're coasting, you haven't got a sense of direction. Um, so yeah, pursue purpose, find your why and do things you enjoy, set goals and and yeah, you'll you'll soon pull yourself out out of uh, of feeling in that in that rut really. Aim high is what I say, aim high. Yeah, man, and you you're spot on as well because if you if you find that why, like what yeah. what is it that you're passionate about, and it might not be you might be listening to this, so it could be running, uh, and you might be thinking, well, what where can I go from that? Find a way, like you said, to help other people because yeah, helping other people it's actually it's both selfless. It helps you, yeah, it helps you, doesn't it? It's it, yeah, you feel good. It releases feel good hormones in your body, much like exercise does as well. Yeah, and you, you want you want to have something that you're passionate about and that may change over time but if you do it's going to keep you going forward isn't it it's going to keep on keep on progressing you whereas if it's just a a goal like oh, i want to do i want to do something you know yeah that's, it's probably not going to be enough it might get you out for for yeah for a time being but you need to really find and i think a lot of people everybody has something they enjoy don't they yeah some people might not know exactly what it is at that exact moment in time but just finding a way to make that um goal orientated and yeah like help people help other yeah. people that are in that area that, that enjoy that too you know so yeah brilliant man so that pretty much sums up what, what you're doing you love running and you know, yeah you're out there trying to help people on so anybody check out his youtube channel as well and make sure that um you comment and create some engagement in there because that's what that's what you're all about, isn't it? So yeah, it is. Yeah, um, for for a lot for a long time, but my editing skills have been poor. But that's 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 another goal, isn't it? It's like yeah, you can you can try and focus on on becoming a better editor. So yeah, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, so that's brilliant, man. We'll, I think we'll wrap it up there, Lee. Um, yeah, it's been great chatting to you, man. And yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Some good topics there, talking about mental health, talking about 
uh, how to avoid injuries. And we could talk about this stuff all day, man. You know, oh, we, we could. We could sit here all day and chat. Yeah. We could. So uh, we'll, we'll get you back on at a, a later date and dive into some other subjects. We can maybe we can be look into the these recovery tactics and stuff and see what see what's actually going on there. You know. Yeah. Um, where can all the listeners reach you then, Lee? So you're on YouTube. Obviously, we mentioned that. Where else have we got you? So Lee runs ultras. Yeah, so Lee runs ultras on on YouTube and um, on Instagram as well. Lee runs ultras. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, if you want to join the Vet I Run group, it's Vet I Run Facebook group. Facebook, awesome, cool, happy days. So uh, yeah, great chat to you, man. Thanks for your time for coming on. And yeah, like I say, we'll do it again sometime. And to all the listeners out there. Remember to reach out to Lee if you want uh, running advice, if you want to check out his YouTube channel, stick some comments in there, like I said, and, and get some engagement going. And I'm sure he'll be able to help you out. Anybody who's struggling with mental health, and I'm sure Lee will say the exact same thing. If you're listening to this and you're like, and you are struggling, and you want somebody to talk to, and if you're still listening to the end of this by now, you can't be that bored of our voices. So <laughs> find a message across to either one of us. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for you there, man, but I'm pretty sure you, you'd be happy for yeah 100% yeah um, we might not be able to help you but we can definitely point you in a direction where you can get some help hopefully and something that's just having an, an ear to listen to that, that really does make the difference so thanks for listening to the podcast hope you enjoyed chatting with, uh, with Lee and we'll see you in the next show please remember to uh share the podcast with anybody that you think would enjoy it so anybody that would be interested in ultra running or these topics please share it with them please remember to subscribe to the podcast on youtube and on apple spotify all the major podcast outlets and i thank you for listening and we'll see you next time cheers chris cheers lee catch you later man